Um, all right, so I'm Dina Brewster. I'm executive director at Connecticut NOFA. Um, we're coming together for the second farm tour of our summer and moving into fall. Um, and the Ecotype project has been still in its infancy, but we, we have some real uh, water under the bridge here and some interesting stuff to share with you tonight. Um, but I wanted to frame this evening's tour uh, out of my experience as a farmer. Um, I, many of us, and I see at least from the participants on the call that we have a really interesting mix of farmers, conservation folks, um, gardeners, naturalists, entomologists. Uh, so the Ecotype Project is really meant to be a table that brings many, many different folks together. But what makes us all the same, um, I would hazard a guess, is that we all really have a profound respect for the power of the wilderness and the power that is imbibed in the natural world. Um, and tonight we are really looking as farmers um, as to how to kind of harness some of that, uh, the strength of the wilderness and put it to work on our farms. Um, I think the Ecotype Project is in essence building a bridge between farmland and the wilderness between the bugs, plants, um, and animals that were here long before we decided to start our farms. Um, I'll keep admitting people as I talk here. Um, and so this evening's conversation is largely about that connectivity between our crop yields, um, what we are harvesting day on day in our farm, and how we can enhance those yields by enhancing uh, the pollinator presence or the insect presence on our farm. Um, so we, the, the course of the evening will go that we were gonna watch a series of videos um, and then have some discussion um, about what we see. Uh, Sephra Alexandra, who is the lead on this project for Connecticut NOFA, um, will start us off with an introduction um, and we'll be here at the end to answer questions. So should you have questions throughout the evening, um, feel free to post them in the chat um, and she'll be navigating that towards the end. So here we go with our first video on um, increasing crop yields with on-farm pollinators. Hi everyone, I'm Sephra Alexandra. I'm the lead of CT NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association pollinator health initiative known as the Ecotype Project. This is our second virtual farm tour. We are working um, predominantly under a USDA specialty crop block grant. And what we've done with that is shown the importance of planting pollinator habitats on farms. Today on our virtual farm tour, we are going to hear from our pollinator habitat specialist, John Campanelli we are going to walk through the beautiful founder plots that we have here um, and we will talk about how they are bringing the diversity of pollinators onto the farm and how it's important to have them here throughout different times of the day, throughout different times of the season and what functions and roles they play in making sure that you the farmers are increasing your yields. When we invite these pollinators to our farms not only are we providing them with the food and the resources that they need, but that also is helping to ensure food security, local food availability, and really making sure that the productivity on your farm is what it needs to be. So without further ado, um, we will go to John at the Hickory's Farm. I'm John Campanelli. I uh, am the pollinator habitat specialist working with the Ecotype Project. Today I'm going to talk to you about how native flowering plants support the health and nutrition of on-farm pollinators. Uh, we're in a zucchini field and we're here to talk about the importance of having healthy pollinator colonies on farm to increase the yields and health of your crops. So this is what a, a healthy zucchini looks like. Uh, you can see that it, it goes fully to the end, it's like a zeppelin. A poorly pollinated zucchini, on the other hand, will not have that rounded end, but rather almost like a rat's tail. It'll narrow quite a bit. In this case, uh, the tail had rotted and fell off, and you'll find that often in, with poorly pollinated zucchini. 
you could see the bumblebees would get into such a flower very easily and take it, take the pollen from the male and deliver it to the female. When that doesn't happen, you'll get the rat's tail as we showed with this poorly pollinated example. So here's an example of a branch of blueberries that have been well pollinated. They are larger and if we open them up, well, you'll see that there are a greater number of seeds. It means that more of the flowers on each branch were pollinated more than once often, which means that they are uh, well pollinated and they got the pollen they needed to uh, produce the seeds that are necessary for juicy and plump blueberries. Here's an example of what happens when they are not well pollinated. They will be hard, they will often not turn purple eventually, and uh, they'll be very bitter. You want uh, the more seeds, the more juice they have, usually the, the sweeter they'll be, and these are for the most part unsellable. So that was our first section of video. Sorry for the technical glitch. That sounded like the sound cut out for a little bit. Um, but I can at least speak to, as a farmer, um, over the course of the last year, having the Ecotype Project work begin to plant these natives on our farm, um, plant all of these pollinator species, um, and then obviously bring in all of these pollinators. Um, it's been a real education for me. I'm someone who has always enjoyed the outdoors, um, but being able to really take a deep dive into how the presence of the of these buzz pollinators and, and beneficials on my farm have changed, <clears throat> excuse me, changed the yields that I get. So one of the things I wanted to talk about initially with um, you all tonight from the farmer perspective is what I would call sort of a baseline shift, which means I was really sort of stopped in my tracks last year at a lecture that I went to in which Kim's Dr. Stoner referred to a study that indicated that we have lost 74% of our insect abundance in my lifetime since 1976. So where, where the study was done in the last 30 years, 40 years. And um, one of the things that was staggering to me about that study is that it's not something that I feel on a day-to-day -day basis. It wasn't like 75% of the insects just suddenly dropped dead. The baseline shift indicates that that slow degradation of ecosystem services on our farm mean that to me, that squash that John was referring to in his video that has that funny shape at the end, maybe it was 3% of my crop, maybe it was 5%, I probably didn't notice when it went to seven or 10%. And suddenly to realize how that translates over the 15 years that I've been farming into a change in my economic bottom line and into the amount of food I can feed people um, has been really staggering. And so being able to increase um, the pollinators means obviously increasing my yield. Um, but we have with us tonight uh, John Campanelli, we have, um, if you can find you, John, and turn on your camera, yeah. um, then um, he and I are going to just talk a little bit, because I did, in watching this video, John, have questions for you, and specific for me, um, I had questions about tomatoes, um, because that's my main crop. You spoke about buzz pollinators, uh, bumblebees in squash. Um, and also in blueberries. Um, but what about tomatoes? My own history as a grower um, suggests that I, you know, that we have seen this slow march away from natural habitats for tomatoes. When I started farming 15 years ago, all of our tomatoes were grown in the field. And then we decided to put them all in high tunnels as that trend happened in agriculture. And all of our tomatoes are now grown in high tunnels. Um, now that our high ton our tomatoes are in high tunnels, we were initially pollinating with electric toothbrushes, trying to, to vibrate them. But um, <laughs> now we're interested in trying to find whether or not we should be using bumblebees. And, and to that end, we're told we can buy them um, and buy them in from Michigan and everywhere else. Um, can you speak a little bit to tomatoes and what that sort of trend has been and how we might combat that? Yeah, can you, am, I, am I coming up? You're coming up. Yeah. 
So um, first I want to talk about the distinction between those crops that need uh, buzz pollination compared to what uh, the kind of pollination they can get from honeybees. Now, um, when we're talking about uh, crops that, need, that, that benefit from buzz pollination, we're talking about uh, blueberries, cranberries, and those in the Solanacea or nightshade family, and tomatoes fall in that. So you would most, you would bring in honeybees would be, uh, you wouldn't get as much bang for your buck. There would be some pollination, but really not that much. And so you really want to bring in buzz pollination. Now, because um, in a uh, high tunnel, uh, the high tunnel situation, uh, one of the other things that helps with pollination is the wind. And so what they found is that uh, if you shake the wires that the uh, each individual plant is grows up because when they grow in high tunnels, they tend to grow much taller than they do when they're outside because they're able to. They don't. They don't. Uh, they have the the wire supports. So one way of replicating the the shaking that happens from wind is that they just simply shake the wires that they that they're attached to. The next level of of uh, pollination is that they you go to each bough that has flowers and you put a toothbrush on it toothbrush and it vibrates. That increases. That increases. The, I, I'm hearing uh, feedback. Is that anyway? Um, anyway, that that actually they found that uh, originally, if you did no, um, uh, uh, you know, man-made uh, vibration uh, pollination in, in terms of that, you went from 18 um, pounds of yield for a plant, and you could start to get it up to into the 20s. And so you you go to maybe go to 20 pounds with the, the hand vibration with the um, of the wire with the uh, toothbrush you get it up to say 24 pounds but then they found that if you brought in pollinators it could you can go from to 25 to 35 pounds per plant so you go from 18 to 25 to 35 with pollinators now one of the ways that they've because you want bumblebees or which are uh, buzz pollinators as your um, as your pollinator that you can bring in managed bumblebees the problem with that is that anytime you're managing a pollinator there are problems you you hear about all the problems with honeybees with colony collapse disorder with verona uh, 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 um, verona mite and, um, and other diseases. Well, they found that because of the stress of being managed, uh, bees become more susceptible. So the problem is if you're bringing in, um, so bumblebees are, I mean, honeybees are not native to us, bumblebees are. And if you are bringing in managed bumblebees and those bees start to become diseased, they actually start to um, live with they escape the, the high uh, tunnel and they uh, start to mate with uh, your wild population. You're gonna to start to spread that disease. So anything you could do to uh, increase the, uh, the presence of wild bee pop, bumblebee populations is good. Then if you're, if you're growing in a high tunnel, you, you're gonna ask yourself, well, how, do my, how am I gonna get uh, these wild bees into my t high tunnel? what they found is that you roll up the sides during the day, you roll up the sides of your high tunnel and you allow access for these wild bees. So the idea of situating near your high tunnel outside of them strips of, um, of habitat that you could then benefit and uh, from the wild populations. And the good thing about that is, is that if you think about it, they, so there's different types of tomatoes, determinant, indeterminate, and, and how they, they, uh, I've, uh, is it the, I'm not a, a tomato specialist. Is the indeterminate the ones that uh, yep. bloom all at once? Yep. Right. So you could bring in the, uh, right. You, you could bring in uh, these managed bees and they'll be there at that time. But if it's spread out over a period of time, you'd rather, you need them all those times and not wanting to rent those hives, those boxes really, they're not hives. Um, so it, it's you know that you're going to have those uh, bees. Uh, them. So it's I, I think that's a better approach. So uh, I, I 
now, of course, obviously, if you have tomatoes and you're not growing them in high tunnel, you would do as you, you would do as with any, any um, on-farm uh, habitats and just locate them close to your, your fields of tomatoes. And again, anything that, that increases bumblebee and other buzz pollinator uh, populations would be a benefit. You know, it's so interesting to hear you say that when we had our first ecotype uh, farm tour, one of the things we were describing were those long founder plots that we are putting on our farm. So we have all of our plants in these blocks and, and we'll show that in the next video. Um, but, you know, it's been extraordinary for me because I've been a beekeeper, you know, for my whole life. Um, and to hear you say, oh, well, in fact, um, you know, this is going to be easier. And I, I think it rings true to my farming experience that um, it's much easier to raise um, flowers for me, these ecotype pollinator strips, than it has been in the last 15 years to keep honeybees alive, um, wow. just because they are so threatened. They're really a species, you know, on the, on the brink. Um, but I wanted to ask you just one more question before we move into the actual um, species of pollinators that we're working with. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the the correspondence between juiciness and pollination. Because for me as a farmer, I recognize that juiciness means more weight, more money, more flavor. Um, all of that is what I'm after. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Yeah. So when I was doing research, we were, we were doing research on uh, the uh, how well blueberries were getting pollinated. And I, the, I thought, okay, you get pollen, it goes, it, it, uh, the pollen meets uh, with a, uh, the, the, uh, the female portions of the flower on a blueberry plant. And uh, I thought one and done, like you have a sperm, you have an egg, and then we get together and they are sperm and they're eaten with, uh, with uh, flowers. And, um, but it turns out that there are several flowers at each uh, bough and that they each, the more uh, of the female portions that you can reach, the more the seeds are produced. The more seeds, the more, uh, the greater, uh, the, the, the berry has to be able to hold those, uh, those seeds and it expands the juiciness. And the, uh, you will find that the, the, the greater, the, they, you can hand, you can take a brush, a paintbrush and hand pollinate and you will get really juicy. Uh, blueberries. If you really want someone to do that, but that's you know not cost effective. Um, but if you if you have more bees, then that'll happen naturally, and you'll find that they will grow uh, more. So the amount of seeds will correspond with juiciness, and the same thing goes with tomatoes. If you want a big juicy beefsteak tomato, um, you'd want it to be pollinated more often, and, and more than say a vibration from a toothbrush or something like that. Yep. It so really, speaks, it speaks to that same, that sort of incremental shift that it's not about, pollination services are not just about no crop or crop. It's about big juicy tomatoes or slightly smaller tomatoes that you might not even notice, right? That sort of shave right. off of ecosystem services. If you have 10 bees visit versus five bees, it actually does make a yield distinction. That's so, so important yeah. for farmers to hear. Now there's there is one thing I don't know. Uh, do, do you know what cat facing is? I, I didn't fully know that. Yes, yeah, so they don't fully know what causes cat facing, which is uh, usually you have form, but it's like bumps and whatever. But they think that uh, pollination contributes to it. That a poorly pollinated uh, uh, flower uh, will lead to it. So that that one you can, those are less sellable than ones that are. Um, smooth. So that's one of the things you can avoid by having well pollinated tomato plants. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we certainly, you know, you certainly make a convincing argument for getting these um, pollinators onto the farm. Our next section of video will go into detail on the individual species, um, not just of plants, but also of the, of the bugs that visit them. Um, and so we'll turn to that now um, with a plan and that's, I think the video is about six minutes long and then we'll plan to have a discussion again at the end of that. So we will see you all shortly. So the first species we're going to talk about is Joe Pye weed. There are several different varieties of Joe Pye weed, but for the most part, they support similar groups of pollinators. 
initially when Joe Pye weed starts to open up, their blooms are very tight. So a week ago, unlike today, there weren't many bumblebees, but there were smaller buzz pollinators called sweat bees. And as they opened up, the group of pollinators that are, are attracted to it has changed. Now you mostly see bumblebees. Bumblebees tend to constitute 75% of buzz pollinators. Buzz pollinators are a particular group of pollinators that uh, certain crops like blueberries, cranberries, different solanacea, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, uh, they are not effectively pollinated by honeybees because uh, they hold their pollen uh, quite tightly and they need to be vibrated to loosen that pollen. Flowers will pre uh, present both pollen and nectar, but bumblebees mostly thrive on pollen. And uh, Joe Pye weed is high in pollen. They're in the Asteraceae family. We are filming in August, so there are some species that have, uh, that have bloomed earlier that were very important as part of habitats. This is Monarda fistulosa. It's very nectar rich. When it's in bloom, you'll find a great density of uh, blooms and a great density of pollinators. Unfortunately, the, the, it's a very aggressive species and you want to, it's effort to keep contained because it can overwhelm the rest of your habitat. But it's important that you add it to your habitat because of how beneficial it is. For each bloom period, you want to have more than one flower in bloom. You want to cater to the different sizes of pollinators. Each pollinator has a different size tongue and they can only access pollen or nectar into which their tongues can penetrate. In this case, any flat top flower, usually you'll find smaller pollinators, which are, are essential. You rarely see bumblebees as you'll see on an agastache or a, um, a mountain mint. Now I'm going to talk about mountain mints, which are essential to most habitats for many reasons. One, they tend to have a, a, a density of blooms, and as you can see here, they support a lot of bees at one time. And in addition to that, this particular species, broadleaf mountain mint, can stay in bloom for one month, four weeks to eight weeks, which is unusual for perennial flowers. And one of the other benefits is that they tend to be very dense and you don't need to weed as much if you plant them. You can also use them in addition to other flowers that are overly fragrant to create a border to prevent foraging by deer. Deer hate the smell of mint. You could use these, create barriers that include mountain mint and also agastache, which uh, smells like anise. We like it, deer don't. So combining the two can help prevent foraging by deer and other wildlife. Another fragrant native plant is agastache or agastache, which as you can see also is very attractive for bumblebees. And you'll notice that the bumblebees that uh, it attracts are larger ones compared to what were attracted to Vernonia, um, New York ironweed, or uh, Joe Pye weed. In addition, as I said with the mountain mint, it can be used as a barrier to prevent foraging by deer, which do not like the smell of them. I want to talk uh, now about goldenrod. It's a very important species in the overall season of blooms. It tends to bloom later in the season. Uh, this particular species is early goldenrod, so it actually starts blooming uh, about a month earlier than other goldenrods. But the problem with early goldenrod is that it's very aggressive and a lot of farmers find goldenrods to be weedy plants. The plants that are going to be sold through the eco type project are going to be goldenrods that tend to clump rather than spread by rhizomes and tend to be more beneficial to pollinators. So don't be scared of goldenrod because they're actually so essential to feed pollinators before they hibernate. But just make sure that you choose those that are less aggressive than say Canadian goldenrod or early goldenrod or common goldenrod. So 
bone set is actually related to Joe pie weed. It's white, but it tends to attract beneficial insects such as wasps and uh, ladybugs, and they tend to be able to live in more dry settings. It's not quite a flat top flower. It's sort of a medium size, so it's accessed by those insects with slightly longer tongues than would access a yarrow. Now I'm gonna talk about black-eyed Susans, uh, the Rudebeckia herta. They're important if you want to plant diverse fields of flowers by seed. Their seed will come up and flower within the first year and they will act as nursing crops for your warm season grasses and your perennials. They'll protect them during those uh, hot summers, shading them when they may be more vulnerable the first year and won't flower. So we're talking about penstemon, bernarda, and milkweeds. Saying that, I again want to just iterate how powerful it has been to me um, when I when you see those images of the mountain mint just you know uh, squ you know squirming with pollinators and bees and and there's so much activity around those plants um, that being a farmer involved with these uh, pollinator habitats has really meant for me understanding how allied my relationship is um, with those pollinators, with those bugs, that they are in fact making juicier tomatoes. They are, they are workers um, right alongside me on my place. Um, but returning to the herta for a moment, um, we have been planting these pollinator strips on our farm and you saw some of them in the video. Um, and one of the things that has been amazing um, is to see the different bugs that are att attracted to each. And yet when we got to the herta, which is why I stopped the video here, um, it doesn't seem that active to me. Um, and in fact, touring the farm with some of the um, farmers, Jean and Abby, who you'll meet in a minute, um, I commented at one point to them um, that unlike the ironweed and the Joe Pye weed, the herta hadn't really seemed that successful. Um, so I want to take a minute now and introduce you to Jean and Abby, Jean Linville and Abby Carsten. I think you can turn on your videos and say hello. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> they will share. Hi, everybody. Hi there. Um, Jean and Abby are here, um, and they have been managing the founder plots for seed production here at the Hickories. Um, and really with us since the beginning. Um, and they are going to share to, uh, with us some of their experiences with this herta, um, the Rudbeckia herta, and then also um, a larger conversation about the insects they've seen. Um, so I will share my screen, um, Jean and Abby, and you guys can, if I can find the next one, um, I will, maybe you could take us on a <clears throat> sort of guided uh, photo tour through what you've been up to. Absolutely. I'll, um, I'll start things off for us. Uh, this, this shot is obviously taken at night. Um, our whole discovery occurred kind of happenstance. We had noticed that we were having um, a bit of an uh, issue in our white wood aster plot with um, European chafer beetles. Uh, they were attacking the plants. And so uh, Abby and I hatched a plan to show up uh, after dark with our headlamps and head out to see if we could see if that's really who the culprit was and what we could do about uh, limiting their their impact on that particular plot. And to get to that plot, we have to pass by the plot of Herta. And so as we're going by, we, we caught all this action in our headlamps. And so um, you can go to the next slide, Dina. We started taking a closer look. Um, so I actually have a red light that's on my headlamp. And so what's nice about this is it doesn't disturb the insects quite as much. So you can kind of do a survey with it. Um, it also makes the flowers look really interesting. Um, but we were blown away um, by how much we saw happening um, on this particular plot, particularly as Dina had mentioned during the day, it never seemed that active. And so it was, a pretty phenomenal to see this. So what we started doing was returning on a regular basis and we developed this through, through trial and error, this tag team effort of photographing. So you're gonna see some of our efforts here where I would use my headlamp to do the lighting and Abby would use her phone to actually shoot the, the photos and the videos. So we're gonna take you through some of what we saw and then 
we'll kind of regroup at the end and talk a little bit more about this little project we've developed. So here we have uh, a number of moths that are on the herta, and this is at night. I think we were somewhere around 11 o'clock at night at this point. And you can see three moths pollinating the herta. And we were totally blown away by the fact that there were so many moths, not only moths, big and small, but insects, spiders, uh, you name it, it was there. And it was a menagerie of, of activity. We were quite stunned. You can go to the next slide, Gina. Here we have a video of one of the moths pollinating the head of the herta and getting, getting some nectar. You see the proboscis going in and probing it and then curling up and then taking off. Um, we also found that, you can go to the next one, that we had these great um, larvae. Uh, this, is, this is the larvae of the wavy-lined emerald moth. And this one is actually decorated itself with the petals and parts of the plant to camouflage itself. It's a great camouflager. And it is actually trying to remove its feces from the petals in order for it to not be seen by predators. We had seen many of these. Um, they are so interesting and they are on not just the herta, but we also saw them on a couple of other uh, plants as well, and the decorations is like they're the fashionista of the caterpillar world. It's like uh, pretty amazing. You can go to the next slide, Nina. And this is what they turn into. This is the adult wavy-lined emerald moth. And as you can see, it's proboscis. It's going right into the herta um, disc and pollinating. I mean, it's, it's, it turns into a pollinator. Uh, after it does a little bit of uh, damage to the flower top, but it usually stays on that one flower its entire life cycle. You can go to the next video, I mean, next slide. Mm -hmm. Here we have the lace wing, the, the green lace wing. Um, on the swamp milkweed. This was in mid-August that we came, and this is at nighttime we came and we had seen these mostly at night. And the reason being, we realized was that the aphids were very, um, were very, um, I, I guess they want me to turn on my camera, I'm not sure, that the, the lace wings were there mostly at night and because the aphids were there they were really working hard to you know they they love these soft body garden pests including caterpillars and small spiders so it was very interesting to see and you'll see in the next slide that um you can go to the next slide that they at this point this was only last few days ago that we found these are the lace wing eggs and they they lay them on a uh, leaf of the plant and on a very very uh, lovely little strand and they are super tiny and Jean had um, gone over there yesterday in the daytime and she said you can absolutely not see them at all it's it's pretty interesting and our next slide is also the famous beneficial, the ladybug, which absolutely always feeds on aphids. And they were abundant everywhere on the farm, um, wherever there were aphids and not, because they are flying and they're trying to track them down. Uh, we, had, we had so many in all of the areas, so it was good to see that. 
This here is a garden spider. Um, they are extremely efficient at pest control. And their Latin name is called the transgilded silver face. So if you really look at that spider, you will see a face, a crazy face in it, as well as the way that the web is weaved. And we had been there, um, I think this is also on the swamp milkweed, we had been there one night and it had caught something delicious that it was devouring. And Gina, Gina and I were like, well, wish we had a good dinner like that. But uh, it was, it was quite, quite fun to uh, see all of these, these things at night. Next slide is the soldier beetle. It's called the margin leather wing beetle. And this we found early spring on the, um, on the mint. And it just roams in and out of the flowers and just moves around collecting pollen on itself and then pollinating as it goes along. Um, it is, it's a beneficial. Um, we're happy to see that there are these, these bugs that and insects that really don't look like beneficials, but this is absolutely one. And um, its larvae also prey on insects. So you can imagine that the life cycle is really extremely beneficial to all of the uh, plants on the farm. And our next is predatory wasps, which were also on the herta. The herta was very full daytime as well as the season progressed because as we found more pollen being um, given up by the flowers, we found that there were many more pollinators coming in and benefiting from that. Um, and including predatory wasps, which once things get going, they come along to try and see what kind of um, provisions they can grab for their nests, um, which is what they do. They, they grab onto small, um, usually insects that we don't want there, which is a good thing, and uh, take it to their own nests for food for their, for their children. And um, next we have the ending, which is a parasitic wasp larvae, which we just found a couple of days ago which means that we've had parasitic wasps on the, the farm and they're so tiny, we don't get to see them. This is such a tiny larva and it's sitting right along the stem. Uh, I think this was also in the milkweed and uh, it's waiting. It's just waiting for a host to come along. I don't know what its host is, but I would venture to say it might be a spider that comes along and they, it, it will attach to it and then lay its eggs in that uh, or, or, you know, feed on that and, uh, and so forth and so on. And that's, uh, that's it. So I think, Thank I you. think, um, Jean, just to interject a little bit with, you know, what you saw, the fact that you saw the looper and then you saw it develop and then now you see that we're seeing these new larvae. I think it points to the fact that this monitoring really needs to be done throughout the season. Um, I mean, we, we've just been so blown away by the diversity of what we're finding. And our plan currently is to just to continue doing this throughout the year, um, even in the winter. Uh, once these are, the seeds are, the seed heads are removed and we leave the stalks, we'll be monitoring them to see what settles in to the stalks to overwinter there um, and just and just the natural progression of things and we've noticed a big change being out this week because now most of our crops are past their their peak flowering they're really in um, setting their seed and and slowing down so our pollinators have have moved on to other lives and we're what we're noticing is a whole other group of insects that are appearing so we're, we're noticing uh, new larvae we're noticing um, many more different spiders that are appearing so it, it's it's pretty fascinating and i would just say that you know 
when you're you're looking at your property, whether it's a farm or a yard or whatever, that it is worth taking the time to do a night survey. And it, it doesn't have to be all hours of the night, although we are thinking about doing a, a 24 hour out there just to see what happens if we can make it all night. But um but what we found is if we if we go out about an hour after sunset, it gets dark enough that then there's a lot of action that starts to tick up. So, and luckily for us, sunset's happening a little earlier. That's the one good thing about the shortening days is that we're out in the field at night and it's much earlier than it was at the, in the middle of the summer. So that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, it's extraordinary for me um, to realize how much of my farm I don't see and that's why I think I had that sort of same jaw-dropping um, reaction to seeing Jean and Abby's uh, photos be and why we wanted to share them with you tonight because in so many ways you know we as organic farmers in specific have all for years and years we have been saying you know we want to mimic natural cycles on our farm we want to bring um, and just sort of do what nature does and farm in a more natural way but so often um, I find in the last year working on the ecotype project work that has been happening on our farm that I, I realize what a tiny tiny scratch of the surface um, we farmers know about how complex these natural systems are. I had heard of lacewings and um, or predatory bugs years ago, the good bugs years ago, because uh, Mary Conklin, who's one of the Yukon Extension um, Age educators, was visiting my farm and found me on the you know brink of tears looking at a spider mite infestation in a watermelon crop, and I was about to lose the entire crop. And I thought, well, you know, the organic certifiers allow you to use these very expensive sprays that probably won't work to kill these spider mites. And I was feeling pretty down. And Mary, with her little hand lens, went out and found in our peach orchard, um, she was scouting around for bugs. And she came in and said, Dina, please don't spray. Wait, wait three days. You have a group of lace wings that are about to hatch. Just don't do anything for a couple of days. Slow down. And uh, Three days later, there wasn't a spider mite on my farm. Um, I didn't have to lift a finger. And for me, that was my first real introduction to the power of these beneficials. It's not a sort of small little good to have. Um, they can be absolutely central to our operation. Um, and so it's really been powerful for me to then now through the work of this project um, to hear both John's perspective on the buzz pollinators and the crop yields um, increasing, and then to understand that I'm, as, as important as it is to observe my farm, I'm really only seeing, most of us farmers and gardeners are only seeing half the picture because we're only seeing um, what we even think to observe during the day. Um, so for Jean, and Ab for Jean and Abby, and I know John, you were willing to come back and talk to us a little bit more at the end. Um, you know, I've spoken a little bit about, from my perspective, what the major takeaways have been in terms of trying to sort of bring in um, the, the powerful and high yielding force of nature. Um, but for you guys, as you think about this project, um, what have been sort of the major or what are the larger questions um, that you might want to see answered in the future. Um, certainly we will have more farm tours in the future as well. Um, but also what are sort of, what is your current thinking? I know Jean, you said you were thinking of overnights, um, but uh, as this project expands, where would you like to see it go and how do you think it could help farmers? Um, if I can just interject, um, I was actually, I just had a conversation with Abby just before this. And, you know, one of the questions that that I'm pondering right now, especially after listening to John and about the specificity that we know that many of the pollinators have and the beneficials is, you know, I'm curious to see that like, are we pairing the right natives with the crops that are being grown at the farm? So are we, are we drawing in insects to those, to those plots that are truly being beneficial to what's being grown in the field? So for me, that's a, that's a bit of a question mark right now. Um, 
and, and I just think that the, the, the takeaway is this level of attentiveness that, and I know it's really hard if you're running a farm to have the time to do this. And that's where if you can find like, you know, a volunteer or, or someone who has an interest in entomology um, that's willing to come by and help out, I think it's a great thing to do um, to point to like, you know, the, the level of detail. I mean, those the, the lacewing eggs are literally the size of like a, a sesame seed. So they're, they're super small. And uh, the other day I was out doing a day survey of the yarrow and all of the insects that were on there that were doing pollinating were smaller than the central head of the yarrow. So it really takes like getting down on your knees literally and, and getting super close. And I actually had a macro lens I threw on my camera so that I could actually take pictures of them because you couldn't even really take a picture with your regular lens. So it's, um, it, it does take that kind of detail and it takes time and it takes the energy. So I think, I think it's super worthwhile. It's a question of if you can't do it, then, you know, maybe you can just find someone who has an interest in your community that would be willing to help out and to do some of these surveys. Yeah. To jump on what Jean was saying is that there's this, this patience that comes with it where you sit, you can sit and just watch what's coming into the field, what's there. And I think for me, one of the things that I would mostly like to try and, and look at for the future is, are we giving those beneficials a habitat in and around the farm? Are we giving the bees the areas for nesting as well and, and to look into those types of things perhaps to see what we can do to help them? Uh, yeah, and with the research I, uh, I did on, we were trying to look at specifically um, how, how could we have farmers get the most bang for their buck for their investment in establishing these habitats. And the biggest, the, the, the measure by which they're going to get their, uh, their investment back is to what degree have we increased the yield of their crops? And I and the only so it has to be that if I get you know they put in a dollar of um, habitat that they're finding that they're increasing their uh, their yields enough to double you know get two dollars for each dollar or three dollars and uh, that it's worth that labor that it's worth sacrificing some land if it's not marginal um, so that's one of the, there's, there has to be more research and there is research on how much you can increase yield. Uh, and one of the things I think I want to look at is the, the spatial relationship between where you're establishing these pollinator strips and how close are they to your relative um, crops. And that this idea of it's, it's uh, one of the things that, that we were encouraging before is that if you have land that's available that you can let grow wild, you'll just have a, a natural, hopefully, uh, uh, native rich uh, meadow that will support it, but sometimes you don't have that extra land. So, what uh, for the marginal, the strips of marginal land? How close can you get them to uh, your crops uh, is important. But for, to uh, going even further, if we're talking about habitats, we're not we're not just talking about providing uh, forage, meaning um, pollen and nectar. You also have to, to keep those, uh, those pollinators and other insects on your land. You want to start to give them nesting opportunities. And since it, most of you are organic farmers, this isn't as important, but uh, you want to provide refugia for um, protection from pesticides. And so those, you're not just going to have flowering plants, but you want to have certain warm season grasses for say bumblebees, bumblebees uh, live, uh, nest in the ground. And if you have a warm season grass, warm season grasses are stuff like a uh, little blue stem, uh, purple love grass. Uh, they have deeper roots because they can um, access water better. So rather than say uh, six inches into the ground, they'll go, they can go up to six feet into the ground. What that does is it opens up the soil, which then makes it easier 
for uh, ground nesting bees to nest in the ground. Um, but so right now in the fall, we will start to, uh, the Ecotype project is gonna start to introduce um, these warm season grasses, which are important to incorporate into your habitat establishment so that you give uh, bumblebees uh, the ability to make these nests. And, uh, but there's also uh, certain, uh, certain, uh, uh, I forgot the term is, uh, certain bees that like uh, small carpenter bees and um, what were the, oh, mason bees, which uh, they nest in the, the soft pith of certain plants, the, the, the hollow stems of certain plants. So they, uh, that's elderberries, uh, raspberries, sumac, uh, and honeysuckle, uh, native honeysuckle. And so incorporating those into, and we, the Ecotype Project will be bringing online ecotypes of uh, woody plants uh, in addition slowly and incorporating those into your habitat because then that means that you'll always have these permanent populations of uh, other pollinators uh, that you, uh, if they have to fly away uh, to, to nest, uh, you're not gonna have their presence as often year round. So often it is the, the answer to so many of my questions in this that the diversity of species is really the um, holy grail here. That the more, uh, the more predators you have on the farm, the more prey you have, the more pollinators you have, the more food you have for the pollinators to eat, the more predators may come the more, and, and somehow our pest issues, what farmers see as pests, um, sort of begin to blend. As I hear you guys talking, the pests blend into a larger community, <laughs> an entomological community in which no one gets um, to take the full stage. Um, and that sounds like the, exactly the kind of balance that so many um, of the best farmers really uh, look, to, look to achieve on their places. Um, I want to invite back in Sephra Alexandra. She's uh, in here as well to turn on her mic and screen and join us. Um, Sephra was going to, um, she has been the lead on this project and is really managing uh, the calendar of events as well as doing a lot of the seed harvesting from the ecotype uh, rows that we have. So Sephra, if I can turn it over to you, um, maybe you could field some of the questions that are out there, but you also may want to talk to us a little bit about um, what, uh, what is coming up next. Hi, every <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. And thanks to all of our panelists. Um, I have to say this project has been so much fun because we always joke about, we put on our bug eyes and we really realize that we're farming alongside these pollinators and it's this great symphony of diversity. And it's almost like there's this wild kingdom safari happening in your own backyard. So it's really exciting to engage as, as farmers with these farmer observations that, you know, the elegant architecture that we see and the harmony that comes from all these ecological services throughout the day and throughout the season. Um, I invite you all, if you have any questions to post them now, but uh, one question, that I can pose that we get a lot that I would love for anyone on the panel to speak to is in terms of the ecosystem function, what do you see as the difference between these ecotype species that we've been working with botanists and organic farmers and nurserymen to make available to homeowners between that and other natives of the same species that you can buy um, that don't have the local genetics? So I'll speak to that. So, um, the when we were, we were showing you the um, the Joe Pie weed, uh, we had noticed that the the first week that they started to open, uh, it was attracting a different uh, community of pollinators compared to later on, and, and that had to do with accessing either their um, their the nectar. So originally there were sweat bees, which were much smaller, and which would cater to uh, those crops as, as that have um, 
smaller flowers and you want them present. Um, but they are given this window by which they could access um, the, uh, those, those flowers with, uh, where they could access their, their nectar. Eco, eco, there's a coevolution that happens in a region for native bees with the native flowers. And if you're bringing in ecotypes from say the Midwest, uh, there's a possibility that the uh, bloom periods are different. And that one week of, uh, say if they, they bloom later, that week where they typically, this particular group of pollinators are expecting to be, uh, you know, to access food, if that's not there because it's not in bloom, that means that that's a week that they may not feed. And that they we have found that if there are gaps in forage, it, that contributes to uh, the collapse of uh, those particular pollinators. So it's important that you have the ecotypes uh, in your region present in order to ensure that there aren't those gaps in forage. Um, great. Yeah, I think, I think it's really important is because um, as farmers, we really like to farm heirlooms. We select for what we think tastes good and what we think looks good. And we have to remember that our entomological fellow farmers have been doing the same thing. They've been stewarding these crops and selecting for what they like and what's best adapted. So putting these plants in the place where they're going to do best and be best adapted to the climate and the pests um, is, is so important for their, their own resilience. And then as we always say, no pollinators, no produce. So for our own local food resilience as well. Um, I'm just looking through the questions right now. Um, let's see. What, um, do you guys see? Oh, so the list, um, Judith asked about a, a list of plants for homeowners to help farmers. Um, so in that screen that I was sharing and I'll share at the end, um, the Ecotype Project now has uh, 12 species in founders pots. And as we amplify the amount of seed we have available, we amplify the amount that will be available to you all. Currently right now, the Aspatuck Land Trust is running an Ecotype plant sale. And so, if you would like to join in the conversation and participate in this great citizen science and stewardship, um, it's a great thing to get some ecotypes on your landscape. Um, Judith, please type in or correct me if I'm not answering your question properly, but um, to support farmers, really, we, um, we ask that you help and support the ecotype project. The more funding and donations that we get for this work, the more species um, we're able to bring through the pipeline and the more farmers were able to support in this work. Uh, Jean and Abby have also been instrumental in creating these um, getting started uh, protocol toolkits. So helping farmers and people who want to establish these pots understand the nuance of what it takes to germinate and caretake and what the associated pollinators are and so forth. So we have a lot of great toolkits that will be coming out and be available if you stay in touch with the project. Sephra, and, I, can, I also can jump in a little bit and speak to Judith's question um, because one of the things in that question um, that really strikes me as important for, for us all to pay attention to um, is Judith highlights, you know, how can homeowners help farmers? And so often in conversations about pollination services, um, we have looked to farmers to solve this crisis. Um, and I gotta say, I mean, from my side of the fence, it often feels like as an organic farmer, I wanna almost say to my neighbors, look, I didn't, I'm not the one who killed off all the bugs by spraying all the pesticides to begin with <laughs> all over the Connecticut landscape. So I, we need all boats rowing together. Um, and what the homeowners that surround, you know, not every farmer is going to have, as John says, the available land or um, the time to devote to putting in, pollin in pollinator habitats, but the bugs don't know the bound, the world, the only ones who see those property boundaries anyway. And so if my neighbor plants 
a habitat of local uh, ecotype plants or native plants, um, those ecosystem services stretch all the way around um, the you know, flight patterns of those bugs. So I may be the benefit of it and their food system may be the benefit uh, to air, may feel the benefit of it. Um, and so I think that sort of um, the common mission between the residential property and the farm property is really probably an important thing that we highlight moving forward. It certainly means a lot to me to think that my neighbors are stepping up to change some of their landscape plants into things that would augment my harvest. And um, what, you know, they, they, the research on what has contributed to the decline in pollinator uh, populations has found, yes, pesticides are a big contributor to it, uh, but um, landscape fragmentation is a huge one. So this idea of, you know, planting, well, in particular, native flowers compared to ones that are hybridized, because the native flowers, when you hybridize a plant, you, in essence, uh, say with roses, you want roses that are uh, blooming more often, but what you sacrifice is the fragrance. And so there's always something that's sacrificed when you hybridize, and often the first thing that's hybridized I mean, a sacrifice as pollen or nectar. And so putting native plants on your property um, is going to increase their abundance. And there's always migration of, uh, we, we don't realize that pollinators, uh, they migrate, they'll go travel far. I mean, well, you can look at monarch butterflies, they will go thousands of miles. And uh, I've worked with the DOT in help encouraging them to not use, um, turf grass, but to, to plant uh, native meadows because we're giving corridors for, for uh, migration. So anytime that you give these pit stops <laughs> on a residential property to, for pollinators, you're helping, help the, you're helping the uh, farmers. Yeah. yeah. And one, one thing that I can say that's, um, that's a very important facet of the Ecotype project is really imbuing this idea of a living seed bank. And um, the ROI of seed, when we plant one seed, we're, we're harvesting thousands off of that each year. And um, there's a lot of very beautiful, fancy words about seed dispersal, dispersal mechanisms, including animocery by wind. So if we think of ourselves as citizen science and stewards along these pollinator pathway way stations, fortifying these ecological corridors, when we plant even just a few plants, the wind and the birds and the insects are gonna help carry that along and proliferate it around us. And when that seed goes back into that soil profile, then that's truly doing regenerative conservation and land stewardship because those seeds in the right, are in the right plants are then in the right place because nature knows what it needs to do. It has all of its um, stratification mechanisms when those seeds go through freezes and thaws. And so our pollinators are really counting on us, especially with all of the land development, if we're ripping all of that out, we really need to not just take things away from nature, but caretake nature and be able to put that back into the landscape where, where they need it. I just want to bring up a point that um, I realized we didn't bring up earlier, uh, that you've heard of IPM, Integrated Pest Management, but there is, uh, has been development in recent years and it hasn't got enough exposure is ICP, uh, integrated crop pollination. So in the same way that uh, the farmers have been looking at how do I uh, br bring in non-pesticide, you know, decrease my use of pesticides, there is an approach as to how do I increase the presence of pollinators and other beneficials. Uh, when we talk about beneficials at this point, we often just think of lace wings and uh, spiders and so forth. But obviously pollinators benefit your crops. And this idea of what can I do so that I'm creating um, uh, an ecology, uh, an ecosystem on my farm that benefits it year round, uh, that's what integrated crop pollination is about. And I think that as part of the Ecotype project, we're thinking of ensuring that there's a focus on that so that what you're planting is benefiting every portion of a, uh, an insect's life on your farm. And uh, there'll be more discussion of that in um, hopefully maybe when we start to introduce grasses and so forth in the fall, as we bring more um, plants online beyond uh, flowering plants, 
uh, we'll introduce uh, concepts of ICP over time. Yeah, and I think I think that's really important, John. Thank you for saying that. Like the the cyclical nature of succession. This presentation shows you that again, this is happening throughout when the flower opens throughout the day. Different pollinators are visiting it, and then even through the evening, and then even through the season. So it's just it's really just this this ongoing adventure. And we're really um, I, I heard this wonderful woman from the south talk, and she said when you're thinking about how to plant for the pollinators um, on your landscape, it's like if you invite house guests over for a week and then you only feed them on Monday, right? So we need to make sure that we have things that are in our landscape that are feeding them throughout the season, throughout the day and throughout the year. So we're really trying to paint the arcs of those diversities um, with the species that we're bringing in to make sure we, we cover all of those bloom times. So um, we have a, a few more minutes for questions if anyone else has any. Um, I, I think there's a question in here about how do you talk to your neighbors? How do you convince other people to get involved? Um, and I would uh, not only encourage you to follow the work of the Ecotype Project, um, but get involved with the Pollinator Pathway because it was really through uh, Mary Ellen uh, LeMay and Louise Washer and the folks who founded um, the Pollinator Pathways all over the state. I think they have over a hundred towns now in Connecticut. Um, it was really through working with them that the uh, groundwork for this project uh, began because they have been talking about how important it is for residential communities to plant pollinator habitats and to, uh, to work on the, on the decline of insects. Um, and yet they came to me and to many of us as farmers and said, but we need the plants. So it's really the agricultural piece, um, the, the bolting on of farmers to their initiative um, that is the, the foundation of what the ecotype, ecotype project was meant to do. Um, so their website, uh, pollinator-pathway, I think it is, .org, um, has tons of resources for uh, even scripted resources for sharing some of this learning out with your neighbors. I would definitely encourage you to check that out as well. So, and I, I'm, I'd also um, just jump in on that and say that there's, you know, just as there's envy of people who have the golf course type lawn, I think what starts to happen too is neighbors start to have envy for the yards that are obviously so full of life with pollinators and birds and and all and all kinds of things and so I think that you can play off of that quite well and and even with social media it's if you're involved in social media just post pictures of what's happening in your space and and people are going to go wait how do I do that so um I think I think there's a lot of ways to do it, and I think more and more people are becoming open to it. I think if that's you know one of the good things that has happened during these periods of self quarantine that we've been going through is that we're all spending a lot more time at home, and I think um, you know we're walking our neighborhoods a little bit more, and we're seeing things more, and we are seeing people who are doing things slightly differently and saying, "Wow, this is this is interesting." So I think. Um, I think that's another way to look at it as well. Um, and to Jean's point, let's see if this will share. Um, let's see. Um, I will give you all my email and I don't think it's coming up. Um, I will type my email into the chat. So it's Sephra at ctnofa.org. And um, we're so excited to have all of you join in. The more farmers and the more um, homeowners that we have involved in the Ecotype Project, the better our pollinators are gonna do. So we all encourage you to put on a headlamp, go out there in the middle of the night, see the magic that is flying around your landscape. Yep, they're ready. And um, I'm so grateful for all of Jean and Abby's dedication to this project and John's wisdom around this. And Dina, thank you so much for putting this on. And so to all of you, please stay in touch with us and join the Ecotype Project as we continue on this entomological expedition. Good night. Bye-bye. Night. Bye. -bye. Bye.